State Board of Directors, and so he's going to talk about what we can do for young atheists. Kevin Bader. He says, I love God. 
his hair is nicely combed, he has freckles. Uh, upstanding kid right there. So that's what happens when you believe in God. So what does a non-Christian look like? <laughs> so his sleeves have been ripped off in a fit of anger. Um, apparently it's not even colored in all the way because we just rip off, we don't even wear clothes. Um, he has alcohol in his hands. It says, the guy is saying like, cussing, God isn't real. He has piercings down like the side of his face. Um, he has tattoos, but they're sticking out of his skin. Like, that went wrong. Um, I don't even know what he's smoking. And look, he has a unibrow. Like, seriously? So here's the thing, though. This kid is eight. Do you really think his pastor is sitting him down and saying, let me tell you what an atheist looks like? I, I don't think that's happening. And I don't think his parents are doing it. So where is this coming from? And I think these kids tend to develop, especially when they're in that environment, they develop this perception of what, what it is to be us and what it is to be them. And them is all of you guys. It's all the atheists, the people who don't believe in, in Jesus and all that stuff. And the thing is, this kid's going to grow up, and at some point, he's going to encounter an atheist, maybe in high school, maybe in college. And so this is what we have to go up against in a lot of places, definitely Texas. Like, you have to deal with that image. So, how do we combat that image? That's an issue we have to deal with all the time. And I think, you know, for me, I became an atheist when I was 14, my freshman year of high school. And I think, from what I've heard, that's the case for a lot of people. Like, they knew they were atheists, they knew something was fishy about what they heard in church. And it happened around that age. So, for a lot of people, you walk around and you're like, I, I can't be an atheist, because that's what an atheist is. And sometimes when you're, even when you're open about it, the people around you think that's what an atheist is. And it's really hard for a lot of these high school age, even younger kids to deal with that. So that's kind of the gist of what I want to talk to you about. I want to show you a video of a high school atheist. She's a young woman. Um, and I don't know if you've all seen this before because it happened about six years ago. And this is a high school atheist who had to deal with crap at her public school because she was an atheist. Have you heard this story before? Um, so let me play this video. Um, I'm not usually an emotional person, but watching this, it's one of the few things that really, you just tear up when you see this thing. So let me play this for you. Then came basketball season. But at the first game, everything changed because after the game, the girls gathered to recite the Lord's Prayer. I didn't think they had religion in sports, but when it came to basketball, they would pray before and after practices, they would pray during games, and, you know, praying was a tradition for them, and that's what they said. Even the other team joins in, and from the stands, school officials too, says Nicole. All the teachers that work at that school, the administration had their hands down, they're saying the Lord's Prayer with the kids, coach has his head down, it's a thing that everyone does. It was uncomfortable for Nicole because she's an atheist. So did you say, no, I'm an atheist, I won't yeah. do it. Well, I told the coach, I was like, oh, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist. So he's like, go to the locker room. Jim. Nicole says, once she said she was an atheist, your relationship with the other kids changed. Uh, yeah. Hello? Uh -huh. <sighs> Sorry, I'm That's all right, that's all right. I'm going to slack practice. And I don't like that. Just mm -hmm. Students called her names, she says. You know, they would call me devil worshiper. I'd walk down all those people would laugh at me. They would look at me really weird and stare me down. Then she says, teachers joined in. Mm -hmm. What would they say? This is a Christian country and you don't let me get out. When the kids hear a teacher say when she goes in the bathroom, I hate that girl, what are you telling the kids at the school? That's a gang, man. Religious gang. School administrators kicked Nicole off the basketball team. They said she was bad for Team Morale and that she'd stolen another student's sneakers. Did you take the other girl's sneakers? No, I borrowed it from her and people saw me give it back to her and, they, and she said thank you. You were late to practice nearly every day. Actually, I was early to practice every day and I ran my laps before the coach got there. A year later, Nicole was allowed back on the team. This time, when the prayer started, Nicole stayed outside the circle. And so I just stood outside and said the pledge of allegiance without the under God. Without the under God. The next school day, she was suspended 
Fearing for their daughter's safety at school, Nicole's parents decided to homeschool all three of their kids. In place of sports, Nicole now focuses more time on music. She taught herself to play classical piano. And she joined with her dad and brother to start a family. They're getting paid gigs. I school, but I don't want to go back to that school. I tried going back to that school for two days, and I couldn't handle it. And it's there's a new kid there, so he's like, oh, I heard about you. You're that dirty little troublemaking atheist. So for now, Nicole's dreams are on hold. Like, that happens. And you all have heard many stories, I'm sure, in recent memory that sound just like that. So here's the thing. That happened about six years ago. Um, there's a book that just came out like maybe a couple weeks ago. It's called The Good News Club by Cap, uh, Cap, uh, Catherine Stewart. And uh, she actually references Nicole in the book. And this is one of the things she says. For every Nicole, there are perhaps thousands who quietly join the circle and mumble the words. Many students praying at their sporting endeavors are themselves not theists, members of other religious traditions, but they know that the locker room is no place for dissent, that a refusal to participate could be seen as a lack of commitment to the team. They learn they have to pray to play. Like, this stuff goes on in high schools everywhere. So, this happened about six years ago. Um, this happened in Oklahoma. And this happened before we started really talking about atheism in a big way. I know some of the books were out, like The God Delusion was out by then and stuff. But the blogs weren't around. The Secular Student Alliance hadn't become as big as it is now. So, you know, I heard about that story. It's devastating. And I actually had the chance to meet Nicole a little after all this stuff went down. Uh, of all places, I happened to meet her the opening day of the Creation Museum in Kentucky. <laughs> so, I, I can tell you now, Nicole's doing really well. In fact, she has a singing career, which is really nice to hear. Um, yeah, it's awesome. She goes by like the, the name Nikki Sky. Um, but that happened a while ago. So here's the question I want to ask. Um, is it getting better for young atheists? Because yes, that happened in Oklahoma, but it's not like it's that much better in what we perceive as liberal states either. And I think, yes, it's gotten a lot better. So what? How, how does that happen? A um, few reasons. So I want to kind of cover why. Why has this gotten better? So one thing is there's just been a demographic shift. Um, and this is something that we might know about or we might have a hunch about, but it's, it's playing out exactly like you might expect. Um, if you can see this, uh, this is a, a slide of how people, how many people claim to be not religiously affiliated. Now, this doesn't just mean they're atheists. It might mean they're spiritual but not religious. It means they're Christian, but they're a Jesus follower. They're not really a Christian. Um, so there is a little bit of that in there, too. But this is for the people born before 1945. It's not a lot. And then you get to the boomers. So this is through 1964, if you were born through there. It's a little higher, 13%. We get to the Generation X, born up to 1980. And then you get to my generation, which is born uh, 1981 or later. We're way up there. That's 26%. What does that mean? That means, a, yeah, that means a quarter of people these days, young people these days, are without religion. They don't hold a religious label. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy if you're an atheist, but it means it's very likely that if you go to school these days at a public high school, you probably know someone who's an atheist and is open about it. And that's a good sign for everybody. And that's one of the things we need to do. We need to encourage those 26% or whatever fraction of them are atheists and agnostics to start saying as much, because that's part of the way you overcome this problem. Um, and while we're on the subject of demographics, I just I saw this and I was like, oh, this, this needs to be shown. Um, when you talk about approval of gay marriage, the same thing, this is not uh, age, this is going by religious belief. So at the very bottom, in terms of acceptance of gay marriage, you see the white evangelical Protestants. Not a surprise, they're at the bottom of the list. At the very top there, that blue line, you see the religiously unaffiliated. So, okay, not surprising, we're at the top of that list. What I like about this is, what if you actually take out the atheists and agnostics from there, and you leave in all the spiritual but not religious, or I'm a Jesus fault? Let's say you just isolate the atheists and agnostics. Where are we? We're up there. That's 80%. That's still like lower than it should be, but cool. The demographics are in our favor. Now we need to help these students who are not religious say as much. 
Here's another thing that makes it better now than it was six, seven years ago. The Christians helped us out. And there's a thing that happened in 1984 called the Equal Access Act. Basically, in, and I, I hope I'm saying this correctly, but in 1984, Christians wanted Christian groups in high schools everywhere. And so uh, Reagan passed a law that basically said if your school offers any sort of extracurriculars of any sort, you cannot stop them if they are religious groups, if they're philosophy groups, whatever. Christians loved it because now they can start Christian groups after school and prayer sessions, whatever. But it also means we can now have gay straight alliances. It also means we can have atheist groups at these high schools. Now, we haven't taken full advantage of that, but we're going to start. And we have been starting, and that's another reason things have gotten better. So the Secular Student Alliance actually hired a campus organizer specializing in high school groups. He's sitting right there. Hi, JT. Now, how did that even happen? That happened because there's a philanthropist named Todd Stiefel who said, look at this high school demographic where there's all these atheists. And they, at least when you go to college, Look at, look at what you, the college groups have done here. You guys created a conference here that is it's pretty big compared to the things I used to run when I was in college. Um, but there are high school ideas out there. So Todd said, how can we help high schoolers get the same level of like community and where, can, where they can talk about religious issues? So he actually gave um, a huge contribution to the SSA for the sole purpose of hiring that guy. And so that... Again, it's a big deal because JT, among his many duties, one of the things he does is he handles high school situations. Turns out there's a lot of scenarios where high school atheists have to deal with some BS at their school. Um, in fact, if you take a look at the list, this is the SSA's growth. And I'll tell you, I mean, I used to help run the SSA. I'm no longer doing that, but I still love the group, and that's why I'm mentioning this. Um, the SSA has grown a lot in the past several years, and it's been steady growth, it's growing fast, but that's for all of our groups. And right now it's at like 360 something, and that was what I checked like yesterday, it's probably doubled since then. Um, but if you isolate out just the high school groups, there's the high school groups. And in spring of last year, that number was a little more than 10. It's like 13. That's spring of 2011. Of all the high schools in the country, that's how many officially recognized atheist groups there were that were affiliated with the SSA. So what's happened in the past year? I don't have the numbers for uh, fall of 2011, but I do have the numbers for spring of 2012. <laughs> that's kind of awesome. How does that happen? You, I mean, believe me, I'll give a lot of credit to JT, but, and I love you JT, it's not just JT. Why is that number skyrocketing that much? And part of the reason is, stories like the one of Nicole, stories like that are starting to get out there. High schoolers are getting a lot more educated about what to do if they're high school atheists. And how, what happens if your principal says, no, you can't start a group? What happens if you can't find a teacher to sponsor your group? They're getting a lot more savvier about it. So that's another reason things have gotten better. The media loves young atheists. The media loves good stories. Good stories have a lot of conflict. There's nothing that gets more conflict than high school atheists. So uh, just a smattering of stories all over the place. This is in the New York Times. Um, teenagers standing to speak up for their lack of faith. This is about a high school atheist group, uh, I uh, think in Florida. Um, but covered in the New York Times, and just an amazing uh, article. If you read the article, you find out, look at all these really intelligent kids that they quote all over the place. You listen to their faculty sponsor, a teacher at the school that everyone loves. And even he, he knows what's going on with these kids. He knows what the situation is for a lot of them. Um, and there's one pullout quote that's just unbelievable to read. And the reason, and I'll show it to you here. Uh, there are students who do not want their parents to know they're, they belong to an atheist club. I tell my mother I'm at Ocean Club. <laughs> Never heard of Ocean Club, but okay. Another member said her father, who's in the Navy, would be angry and disappointed in her. Um, well, she asked that her name not be used for fear it would hurt her father. I don't want to grow a part of this. Really disappointing and sad that you were still at that point. But the fact that this is in the New York Times and people can read that and see what young atheists have to deal with, 
That's a huge story. That's a big deal, because people get to see what it's like to be a young atheist. And that wasn't always the case before. You didn't always hear those stories. Um, the Southern uh, Law Poverty Center, the one that puts out that hate group list every year, they actually, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, they release a magazine called Tolerance, and they actually send it to public schools across the country. Um, and I actually, I work as a high school teacher. That's my day job, I teach in a public school. I saw this magazine lying around, like in our faculty, whatever you call it. Like, it was there, these things go everywhere. And they had an issue last spring, uh, last year, that talked about the unaffiliated, those people who don't belong to a religion. And they talked about all these stories we hear about and what atheists have to deal with. But I think the part that I really love the most is, on their website, they have a supplement to this article. And the supplement said, uh, hey teachers, if you want to talk about how outsiders are pressured to conform by groups, or atheists like us suffer ostracism, but find several examples of that in the article. Have your class do that. Feel free to add to the list other examples of ostracism. I mean, they're basically talking about the, the victimization that a lot of atheists have to go through, the bullying a lot of them have to deal with, and saying, let's have a discussion about this because it happens, it's out there, it's important, let's deal with that. Here's another story about an atheist uh, high schooler. This is a senior at Stephen Austin High School in Houston. Um, tried to start a group, tried for months to start a group, and then the principal said he could have the club if he just called it the Philosophy Club and didn't affiliate with the Secular Student Alliance. Because, yeah, when the Fellowship of Christian Athletes wants to meet, they say, it's, let's just call the dudes who play sports. <laughs> but, again, as soon as that was brought up to USA Today's uh, radar, what did they do? They contact the school again and again and again. And then, best part of the article, after a request for comment, the school abruptly <laughs> gave him the Secular Student Alliance Club. Cool. Again, all we have to do is put it out there. Most people, even if they are religious, they don't want to see anyone denied the right to do what everyone else gets to do. Um, when you see a student who just says, I want to start a group for atheists, well, they may not want to join, they may not be happy with it, but I'll guarantee you most people want to see that student have the chance to form the club. And so all we got to do is expose this and show that that's going on and it helps. Uh, another student, this girl's name is Crystal Myers, and she's from Tennessee. I used to live in Tennessee. I didn't live very far from the school she works at, uh, she went to, or goes to. <clears throat> but at the very bottom, you see, she works for the school newspaper, and she wrote an article about what it's like to be an atheist, and like, why does atheism have such a bad reputation? Kind of like an op-ed piece for a school paper. They wouldn't let her publish it. Why? I'm sure they made up some reasons, but it wasn't that it was a bad piece. But again, what do you do? You bring this to the media's attention, which I believe she did, and then the Knoxville News Sentinel, the biggest newspaper in that area, published this article about how the school won't let her publish this piece about atheism. So what did the News Sentinel do the following few days later? They published it on their site and in their newspaper. <laughs> and so that appeared. Hey, there's the whole article that maybe a few people would have seen and a few people would have hated, but hey, let's put it in our newspaper that goes out to hundreds of thousands of people um, and on our website where the internet world can see it, so yay. Um, one more way the media is helping us out. Here's a clip you never would have seen a few years ago, but I want to show you this clip. It's from Glee. I have to apologize. There's a watermark on it, but just listen to the dialogue even if you know nothing about the show. Thank you, Mercedes. Your voice is stunning, but I don't believe in God. Wait, what? You all profess your beliefs on just stating mine. I think God is kind of like Santa Claus for adults. Otherwise, God's kind of a jerk, isn't he? <coughs> when he makes me gay and then has his followers going around telling me it's something that I chose, as if someone would choose to be mocked every single day of their life. And right now, I don't want a heavenly father. I want my real one back. But Kurt, how do you know for sure? You can't prove that there's no God. You can't prove that there isn't a magic teapot floating around on the dark side of the moon with a dwarf inside of it that reads romance novels and shoots lightning out of its boobs, but it seems pretty unlikely, doesn't it? Is God an evil dwarf? We should be talking about like this. It's not right. I'm sorry, honey. But you all can believe whatever you want to. But I can't believe something I don't. I appreciate your thoughts. 
but I don't want your prayers. Yeah. And he's a popular character on that show, too. He's not like the, I mean, he's a show about outcasts, but he's not the outcast of that much. Um, so, you're starting to see all these stories about atheists, and the best thing we can do to help out young atheists is if they have a problem, it's more often than not a legal issue. Um, yeah, everyone's gonna have some interpersonal conflicts, that happens in high school, but a lot of times these kids have administrators who don't want them to form a group. They have teachers who don't want to help them out. And all we gotta do is show the people, look, this is the law, and by the way, we got the whole media on our side, and they change really quickly. Um, and here's the other reason that we start, things are getting better. We started helping these kids out. We didn't do this for Nicole in the way that you've seen people do it now. But um, it started to happen. I don't know if Damon's here yet, but um, if you guys know Damon's story, um, this is, the, the way I've heard about Damon's story is he challenged a prayer that was going on at his graduation ceremony. But this is the part that really uh, stuck with me. This is the article. Basically, uh, they, they mentioned a teacher who teaches at his school. She's been on the staff for almost 25 years. Um, and then at the very bottom, what's even more sad is this is a student who hasn't really contributed anything to graduation or to their classmates. Whoa! Like, what teacher disses a student in the media? Like, believe me, there are some kids I would love to do that to, but I never do that. But, but as soon as that happened, and he challenged it, and it looked like he, uh, as soon as he pressed the issue and it started getting media attention, his parents basically kicked him out of the house. Um, so you'll hear from him later today, and his story's really compelling. But what was really cool is when, you know, that was brought to my attention, we started raising some funds for him, because, you know, for a scholarship or something, so you can get the heck out of uh, Louisiana, where you're from. Um, and they raised like $31,000 on Damon's behalf. <laughs> And then, uh, the story I kind of want to end with, just because it seems like such a parallel of Nicole's from the beginning, another young, intelligent high school student who happens to be, it's like her against the world, um, is Jessica Alquist. And uh, her story, there was a prayer banner at their school. She wanted it to be taken down. The ACLU said, yes, it should be taken down. And then it seemed like everyone at the school, even her mayor, uh, all said, no, it should stay up. So fine, bring it on. And uh, Jessica won the lawsuit, but at the expense of being even more ostracized than she already was. And mind you, she doesn't live in like the Bible Belt. She lives in Rhode Island. But, I mean, her own teachers said things about her. Her classmates said things about her. Her state senator called her an evil little thing. So, hey, JT and other friends created these shirts that said evil little things. <laughs> she wore it as a badge of honor. Um, and once again, we're like, you know what, this is a student who needs help. Let's, let's see what we can do for If we can raise like 30000 for Damon Fowler, what can we do for, for Jessica? Um, and this time they pitched in even more. Um, and with the sales of the t-shirts, and I got an email from a guy who's like, you know, I don't want to go through this particular uh, chip-in widget, but I want to donate $5,000. How can I do that? I'm like, send a check to the American Humanist Association, because they're awesome, and we'll add it to the list. Um, and overall, uh, I was able to present Jessica with this check for like $68,000 a couple weeks ago. I, I'm not bringing this up because I'm saying we need to raise money for all of these kids, but I do want to point out that their stories, as soon as people heard about their stories, the emails I kept getting were, how can I help this person? And this was one easy way to tell them how to help. You got a couple bucks, chip in. Um, and what you wouldn't believe is, I think there were 1,800 people who chipped in on the website, and they were all giving like two bucks, three bucks. That's how we raised that money. It wasn't like one dude with a lot of money. That's all money that came in quantities of like tens or something. Um, the whole point is, these stories happen. How can we help them? Well, we help them by one, exposing their stories. We help them by just giving them a chance to realize they're not alone, they have support on their side. I mean, you could go to some of those school board meetings she went to where they fought over this prayer banner, and you saw Jessica calm, under pressure, explaining reasonably why it should be taken down. And then you have like the whole back crowd in the balcony screaming like why God was being taken out of the schools. Um, and one other thing I want to bring up, she did an interview um, on CNN, 
and I want to play it for you only so you understand why this person is someone you wanted to help. You listen to her speak and you're like, this, this girl gets it. Like, what a good spokesperson for our cause. We were just showing some pictures of uh, angry parents who were um, uh, you know, very loudly talking about the Pledge of Allegiance and saying the Pledge of Allegiance in this meeting that clearly became very uh, you know, full of anger. What do you make of the, the hostility that's come out around this? You've gotten death threats, is that correct? That's correct. And um, it's been really difficult, obviously, just to um, constantly have this feeling of hatred towards me in my community. Um, the meeting itself was difficult, but it, it's kind of what's been going on for a long time now. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm ready for it at this point. Um, but you never really get used to hearing about how bad you are, really. Um, it, it, it always hurts, and the death threats obviously have always hurt my feelings. Um, I've just kind of gotten to the point where I can cope with it. It's not so much that I'm, you know, okay with it happening, but I'm able to cope with it. There's a congressperson, a uh, state rep, who, um, Peter Palumbo, and he said this about you. He said, you are an evil little thing, and you've had to have a police escort take you to school. Have you responded to him? Um, I haven't responded to him directly, but the response so far to that comment has, it's almost a bit of a mockery. Um, I feel it's immature and inappropriate for a state representative, who represents me also, by the way, um, to be calling me something as petty as an evil little thing. And so, while it does kind of hurt a bit, um, we've kind of turned it into a, a joke. I've heard about and that. I got a friend who's, uh, <laughs> who's now co-opted the phrase, I hope you've trademarked that evil little thing, right, and turned it into t-shirts that he's selling so that you can help fund your college education, is that right? That is right. Um, there's a website where people have been purchasing the t-shirts and um, I've seen lots of people um, at the meeting wore them and um, people take pictures of themselves wearing them and post them to Facebook so I can see and, and I think it's really cute and in a lot of ways I think his little comment has kind of backfired because now we're using it as a positive thing. You know, it's, it's almost a way of saying that people stand with me. Just go. Did she actually say that death threats hurt my feelings? <laughs> Oh my god, what does she have to go through? Um, okay, so, I mean, how can you not want to help her out when you hear that? So, what can we do now? What can all of you do to help these young atheists? Um, one of the things, going back to this slide of the high school atheist groups, I don't quite know what I want to do with this, but I know that if I want to focus my activism in a certain place, this is where it's going to be. So this summer, um, I don't know what I have planned here. But it'll be something to help that bar graph, but that bar on the far right grow even higher. Because that's where it needs to grow. It's amazing that the college activism has grown to the level that it has, but this is where the next, this is where our focus has to be for the next little bit. Um, we definitely need to help high schoolers realize that it's good to come out and say you're an atheist. And it's good to have those discussions at that age when people are forming their opinions about religion and talking about this stuff. You know, uh, last, at the beginning of this school year, some of my own students, some of the kids who know me pretty well, because we, I didn't just have them in class, but I coached them and other stuff, they came up to me and they said, we want to start an atheist group. And my first thought was, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, you know what? I mean, I can't be the person running this club. If you guys want to do it, I will do everything I can to help you out. But it's got to be your group. So in the back of my head, I was wondering, what, what would a high school group even want to do? Because honestly, I think I fell into the stereotypes too. Like, what do they want to do? Is it form a group to like make fun of Christians, make fun of Christian beliefs? And I didn't say any of that, but I was like, so what do you want to do with this group? And these girls said, well, we want to let people know it's OK to be an atheist. We want to definitely do a lot of community service. Um, and we just want to have a discussion about this stuff, because we don't get that anywhere else in the school. Oh my god, that's amazing. How many of you are out there? Like, there's a ton of people out there. And, you know, if they know there's a teacher out there who might at least be sympathetic to what they're doing, maybe they can get those things going. Um, it turned out that that particular group, you know, they're juniors, they have a lot of stuff going on. It didn't form as it did. Um, but maybe it will in the future. But I think one of the nice things is without going out of my way, I don't talk about religion in math class, obviously. Um, but it turns out a lot of the kids 
seem to know that I'm an atheist. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but one of the cool things about it is, um, you know, I don't think anyone's offended by it. I, I know I have a lot of deeply religious kids, and they know I'm not, like, giving them a lower grade or something because of their faith. Um, and I have a lot of atheist students who are more, I, I hear them, I see them being more open about it, and it's not because I'm around, but I think it's because they feel like, oh, no, it's not going to be it's so bad, because they know I'm there. Um, I work with a group uh, called Foundation Beyond Belief. If you see uh, Zach Moore in the back, he works with them too. Um, awesome organization, it's a charity group. We, we kept seeing these numbers that say religious people give a ton of money to charity better at a better rate, at a higher rate, than non-religious people do. So the question is, how can we get atheists to give money to charity in the same level? Because we all give money to charity, but it's never as a group of atheists. It's always kind of on our own. Well, is there a way to collect that and say, look what a group of atheists can do? And uh, this, in the we change our charities. Every three months, we select a slate of charities that aren't uh, atheist charities. They're just awesome groups doing really cool things. Uh, for example, uh, last quarter, we had the uh, It Gets Better project, the Dan Savage thing. Um, we had a group this month, uh, uh, this quarter, that's trying to get debate teams in urban schools. Just really neat charities. And last quarter, we gave over $40,000 to those five charities, which is unbelievable. And that's atheist money. And in two years, in the two years since we started, we've raised over a quarter million dollars. And that's all with atheists wanting to chip in and help out. If you're interested, it's foundationbeyondbelief.org. The reason I bring it up here is starting this summer, we're going to be uh, doing a, uh, something that focuses on how to get young atheists involved in the same process. Because obviously high schoolers don't have their own money, usually they're borrowing it from their parents. But how can we get those kids in a habit of giving so that it's just become second nature to them? Like, there's no heaven, so we gotta do what we can on earth. How can we get them to do that? We're gonna start that project. Um, JT will be launching a project this fall called the Secular Safe Zone. Uh, it's modeled after something that's in the uh, LGBT community, but it's kind of a sign. You could, for example, it's a sign you could put in your classroom that says, if you're an atheist, you're not going to get any harassment uh, in my classroom. Something we can give teachers to put up in their room, among a lot of other things that will happen as part of that program. But the biggest thing is, if, and I say this to any college student who's here, if you are a college student and you have friends who are still in high school, help them form a group, especially if you're part of one here. You know how to do it. It's not that I mean, for all the paperwork all of you guys have to go through to get something going on a college campus, it's actually a lot less at high school. You just gotta talk to the right people. And if you have trouble, there are a lot of people who are willing to, to help you out on that. Um, so, whatever you can, if you have ideas for ways that we can help high schoolers, please stop me today and tell me what you think we can do. Because um, I would like to know, and I'd like to know what I can do to make that happen. So, I will stop there. My contact information is here if you ever have any ideas. And uh, if there's a few minutes left, I can take some questions if anyone has. So, thank you. Um, 
So yeah, it's definitely an issue. We need to address it. I remember a couple years ago, because of things I wrote on my website that a Christian right group didn't like, they actually sent an email not only to the math department chair, my immediate boss, and to the entire administration at my school, and to the whole school board that basically said, you know, he's a teacher, he's supposed to be a role model, but look what he's writing on his atheist website. So to their credit, the school board basically responded with, he doesn't do that in school, so why should we care? I got very lucky, because not every administration is that, uh, and I'm not even, I don't, I think they're all pretty religious people, actually, but they know what the law is, and they know I don't cross it. Um, so I got lucky in that sense, not every teacher is that lucky. But yeah, we should, I'll look into it to see what we can do about that. Yes? How far do you think student groups at high schools can go because of the coming out issue? <clears throat> in terms of what? How far can they come uh, well, most kids I know, very few are coming out to their parents in college. Yeah. And how are people going to be able to come to a high school group if they're afraid their parents are going to come to find them? Sure. Um, so how can kids, like, how far can kids go if they're coming out and stuff when they're in high school when, you know, their parents want them to still go to church and all that stuff? I, you know, I don't know if you have to necessarily come out to your parents as an atheist. I don't know if I would advise kids to come out as atheists to their families. But to your friends who you know, to a trusted adult, it's possible. Um, but in a lot of cases, that may not even be the biggest issue. Maybe the biggest issue is just having a place to talk about these things. And to be honest, you know that issue where Brian had read, like you could start an atheist group, but just call it a philosophy club. You know what, if it, you want to call it a philosophy club, I disagree with the principle of the thing, but if there's a place for them to have those open discussions, I think that could be more, more worthwhile than making these kids who may have to deal with parents who are just deeply religious, uh, people they trust who are deeply religious. That maybe it's not the biggest issue that they have to be an out atheist at that age. People always find out though. People always talk. That's the biggest <clears throat> issue I see with high school groups. Then we need to find a way to make it safer for them to talk about this stuff. I mean, yes, you're right. I mean, people are going to, if a kid wants to get back at another kid, you can always out them. Um, so we have to find a way to make it safer for them. Um, that's, that's definitely a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I throw something in on that real quick? Please. Uh, with the Safe Zone project, it's going to do a lot for connecting students with teachers <coughs> who empathize with their worldview and can help them come out if it's what they want, but can at least keep it quiet and give them someone to talk to. Um, but with, with that, with the growth of the high school program, you can at least have students visiting who are saying, I'm just checking it out. Oh, sure, I'm still Christian, but I'm just checking it out. You know, and that's something we can do. Thanks. Yeah, I guess it's kind of, kind of a follow-up. Do, do you know what the school's responsibilities are with regard to informing parents about what groups that kids are participating in? As far as I know, there's no such requirement. I mean, if it's like a competitive activity, there might be a fee. That's not what we're talking about here. But there's no rule that I've ever heard of that says the school has to tell parents what clubs the kids are part of. Is there a rule that they can't to that? Not to my knowledge. I don't know if someone else knows anything about that. Yeah. That and our high school group um, specifically avoided any organized field trips because we would have to get permission slips and all that kind of stuff. The kids wanted to do that, but I said, the minute I send this form over, and you're not out to your parents, and I'm advising not to be, you're out. And they tiptoed back to that pretty quickly. We found, I mean, there were ways around it. They could drive themselves, but if I were there, that made it an official event. And I just, I dodged that bullet every time. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm a teacher here in Plano, a uh, high school teacher, and the way it works here is you have, you can't start, I can't start a club on my own. It, it has to be student-led, student, student, uh, student-driven. I can only be a sponsor, but I can't tell students, hey, if, if anyone wants to start a club, I will sponsor it. So I was wondering if the, uh, that uh, safe secular zone or the SSA can have a list of teachers that are willing to sponsor or you know, if they can put us in contact, and I'll put my name on there and say, hey, anyone in Plano, you know, I contact me. If you're yeah, contact me. I can, I can definitely help. But it's, it's also tricky. Uh, a couple years ago, a coworker of mine, the students asked him if they could have a magic 
club. They were just, he was going to teach them how to do magic and perform and things like that. And ultimately it got shut down just for that. So it's, it is going to be a, a challenge. So I'm almost wondering if it would also be beneficial to have something outside of school. And I don't know the... It's, I mean, as a teacher myself too, I'm, I'm very hesitant about doing anything outside of school with any of the students. I understand the concern though. Um, I think part of the safe zone will be here some teachers, uh, maybe JT can correct me if I'm wrong, here are the teachers who are willing to sponsor a group or something like that. I, I don't think that would be a bad addition to that uh, thing to have. Uh, but it's definitely tough because, yeah, believe me, I'm more than willing to help sponsor a club, but I'm not going to tell any student to do it. Um, but hopefully if I can put myself out there and the kids know, maybe through personal conversations we have or whatever, um, and hey, then they can get the ball rolling. Uh, please. Um, it's actually illegal for a high school teacher to approach students and say, do you want to do this club? The, the, the which, is, which is what he was saying, yes. Right. Um, the safe zone will tell students uh, which teachers are more, most likely to help them. And we can even have religious allies in the safe zone program. Um, so, yeah, I forgot what point I was going to make, but never mind. Yeah, so <laughs> there, it'll be possible for students to find out, you know, which teachers, uh, at least that's the goal, which teachers are more amenable to those ideas and discussions. Um, the whole, I mean, what do we get out of all this? There's a lot of challenges at the high school level, and I mean, for all the troubles college groups have sometimes getting started, even dealing with their own administration, that challenge is a lot harder at the high school level. But it can happen. What has to happen is we have to let students know this is what you can do. And again, they're, they're reading the stuff online. They see a lot of the stuff because they're looking for that information now. Now it's there for them. Now we can help them out. So it's, it's, a lot of it's on them. You know, if you're an atheist and you're young, here's what you can do. And here's where we can help you out, but you gotta you gotta take the ball and go with it. Um, and hopefully we'll be there for them, supporting them. And if anything stops them, or if they're getting crap because of it, we'll be there to support them and back them up. So that's the goal. There's a long way to go, but like I said, I think that's where one of the places we definitely need to focus. So that's what I'm going to be working on for for a while. Thanks.